a lot of discoveries we celebrate today weren't birthed by serious research. In fact, most didn't have any link with science. Take the discovery of gravity or gunpowder for example. Their eureka moment just happened, earning them a fortune and a name in the archives of history. For gunpowder, a French immigrant went hunting in America and discovered the need for sophisticated firepower. However, it took a whopping 40 years before the right chemicals were put together, bringing DuPont and his family their ticket out of the trenches into reality. Join us in today's video as we take a close look at the gunpowder industry and how the DuPont family navigated it. Now let us fire away. Ideas rule the world, but value sustains it. For one that desires to create generational wealth, the focus shouldn't be on ideas alone, but on value. DuPont understood this principle and was able to use it to his advantage. In the early 1800s, a French immigrant went hunting in America and he was shocked by the poor quality of the gunpowder so he decided to start a business making his own. He was a chemist and he raised $36,000 from investors in America and France. The gunpowder company of E.I. DuPont de Nemours & Co. was launched in Paris in 1801 and was made official in the United States in 1802. DuPont bought land from Jacob Broom on the Brandywine River near Wilmington, Delaware to build a factory for this business that soon became a billion dollar dynasty. The DuPont family lived in France before coming to America. It was the period of the French Revolution and times were really hard. People wanted to get rid of the king and have a government where everyone was equal. E.I. DuPont was a young man during the revolution. He worked in his father's printing shop at the time but wanted more out of life. Some say that he was influenced by the amount of violence and guns flying around but even as a boy, DuPont had always wanted to make explosives. His father, Pierre Samuel DuPont de Nemours, was a nobleman who worked for the king and also wanted to make the government better. He became the leader of the National Constituent Assembly, which was the new government of France at the time. After Pierre and his son E.I. defended King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette from an angry crowd, Pierre was sentenced to death, but he escaped punishment because of a change in government. In 1800, Pierre, E.I. and his other son Victor moved to the United States with their wives, children and other relatives on the ship American Eagle. They quickly became important figures during the Industrial Revolution. The DuPont family arrived in New Jersey on January 1, 1800. Pierre and Victor were excited about all the possibilities in their new home. They started a company called DuPont Dinamore's Father and Sons Company of New York and began thinking of ways to make money. Pierre even got help from Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, who were the leaders of the two main political parties in the United States. Meanwhile, E.I. DuPont was exploring the new country. On a hunting trip, he noticed that American gunpowder was poor quality and expensive because there was no other option in the sparsely populated wilderness. E.I. had a background in chemistry and powder making, so he pitched an idea to his father and brother to build a powder mill along the Brandywine River. Quality gunpowder was mainly produced by Great Britain, but the DuPont, Jefferson, and French financial backers supported E.I.'s idea. They hoped that the mill would increase French influence on the United States and strengthen the relationship between the two countries. In 1902, E.I. DuPont de Nemours & Company was founded for $36,000. Before we tell you more, be sure to like this video, subscribe to Old Money Chronicles and turn on post notification now to stand a chance of winning a front row seat at our next video. The seats are limited, so do smash that like button and subscribe to Old Money Chronicles right now. DuPont began construction of his gunpowder factory, which he named Eleutherian Mills in the summer of 1802. Eleutherian Mills began operation one year later. The first barrel of gunpowder went on sale in 1804. The kegs were marked Brandywine Powder. E.I. DuPont de Nemours and Company recorded its first sale on May 16, 1984. And so, the mid-Atlantic gunpowder industry flourished in the 19th century along the Brandywine River in Delaware and spread into Pennsylvania, New Jersey and other states. Sales agents were hired to sell and market powder locally in cities throughout the United States. 
These agents would play an important role in the success of the company. Remember we had earlier mentioned that DuPont was a chemist? One nature common with chemists is that they mix things up. Well, after many trials and mixing, they arrived at having an explosive powder. DuPont's mill used local willow trees to make charcoal, sulfur, and saltpeter that was shipped in on the Delaware River. The mill was powdered by water wheels and turbines from France. It quickly increased production, making and selling 39,000 pounds of gunpowder in 1804 and tripled that amount the next year. In 1807, sales reached $43,000, an all-time high for a company that's barely five years old. During the War of 1812, the United States government bought gunpowder from DuPont, which increased sales. In 1812, DuPont sold more than 1 million pounds of powder at an average of 40 cents a pound to the U.S. government and military units. Sales reached $148,597, which is worth about $2 million today. This whopping profit was used to purchase 62 acres of land adjacent to Eleutherian Mills for a factory on the Brandywine River in 1813. In their fashion of naming things, the factory was called Hagley Yard. The Delaware Hagley most likely took its name from an English estate that was well known in the 18th century. There's no other recorded use of that name in either Europe or in North America. The name Hagley was already in use well before E.I. DuPont purchased the land. Documents from this time describe the property as Hagley and Estate. The earliest recorded use of the name is from 1797. That year, Philadelphia Quaker and merchant Rumford Dawes, who owned the land, applied for insurance on buildings at a place called Hagley situated on Brandywine Creek. In 1813, Erin A. bought the Hagley estate from Thomas Lee to add new powder mills. Employees got a company savings plan with Erin A. paying 6% on accounts of $100 or more. In 1815, Bodie left the company, set up his own powder works south of Wilmington, and sued Erin A. over his DuPont share value. The litigation lasted until 1824 when it was resolved in Erin A.'s favor. With this expansion, E.I. DuPont Dinamores and Company became one of the world's largest producers of explosives. Every company, however, was not without losses, more so a company that produces explosives. It was quite to be expected that there would be cases of explosion. Making gunpowder was obviously dangerous for the DuPonts and their workers who lived near the mill. The most dangerous part was fixing the wet ingredients into a paste called serpentine. This was then pushed through a mesh to form granules which were dried, pressed into blocks, and milled twice to make a fine powder. Strict safety rules were in place. To prevent the powder from igniting, machinists' whale oil lamps were covered in glass, powder men's boots were held together with wooden pegs, and the horses' hooves were covered in leather. On New Year's Day 1811, a notice was posted at the mill stating, All kinds of play or disorderly fun are prohibited. However, the first mill explosion happened on the 25th day of February 1811. This tragic event took place at the original DuPont powder mill site near Wilmington, Delaware. After this event, the safety of everyone who worked within and around the mill became a priority. Rules were laid down for workers. Workers must wear shoes without nails to avoid sparks and are made to turn out their pockets to show they aren't carrying matches. Irene DuPont went further to establish a pension plan for the widows and orphans. Even though the DuPonts took precautions and measures were put in place, a pounding mill exploded again in June 1815, killing eight workers. In 1818, a bigger explosion destroyed five mill buildings and killed 36 workers, including Sophie, the wife of E.I. DuPont, who was injured. After that, alcohol was banned from the workplace. E.I. and Sophie's son, Alfred Victor DuPont, worked with the powder men to rebuild the mill. He became the head of the company in 1837. His brother, Henry DuPont, took over in 1850 when Alfred retired. Their younger brother, Alexis I, died in a fire at the mill in 1857 along with five other people. Truth is, even after the War of 1812 ended, people still needed gunpowder. 
DuPont gunpowder became popular with hunters and a busy period of national development between 1830 and 1860 increased the need for gunpowder to blast open coal mines and build roads, canals and railroads. The DuPonts responded by creating new products and expanding their business. In 1857, Lamont DuPont, the son of Alfred Victor DuPont, developed beat blasting powder. It was more powerful than traditional black powder because it used sodium nitrate instead of potassium nitrate. In 1859, the company bought the Wapwallopin powder factory outside Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania to make the new powder. They also did more research on black powder and created mammoth powder for heavy artillery. The mill made about one-third of the gunpowder that the Union needed. Because the mill was making gunpowder faster during the war, the packing room exploded on February 26, 1863. The explosion destroyed 10,000 pounds of gunpowder and killed 13 men. There were two more explosions that year, killing 40 more men. During the Civil War, the Brandywine powder mills continued to grow. By 1902, DuPont was operating 40 gunpowder and explosive plants from the Mid-Atlantic to the new western state. This led to claims that DuPont was a monopoly. Of course, success always comes with friends, admirers, as well as enemies. In 1906, a former DuPont employee named Robert Waddell claimed that the DuPont Powder Trust was charging the U.S. government too much for gunpowder. In 1912, DuPont struck a deal with the Justice Department to spin off the Hercules and Atlas Powder Companies. The new companies will produce half of the country's black powder and 42% of the dynamite. Sales had totaled $35 million, which would have been worth $636 million today. Voices were rising that DuPont was monopolizing the gunpowder industry. What was going to happen at this point? Will the company suddenly have worthy competitors spring up, or will they be forced to split up? As a result of the Sherman Antitrust Act, DuPont was forced to split into three companies in 1913, namely Hercules Powder Company, Atlas Powder Company, and DuPont. This was the smartest decision the company could make at the time. Hercules and Atlas were each able to produce 50% of the country's black powder and 42% of its dynamite. Atlas began business on January 1, 1913 with four former DuPont black powder plants and three former DuPont dynamite plants. Although DuPont had been forced to split, most of the executives at Hercules and Atlas were former DuPont executives. The connection between the three companies remained strong, and Hercules and Atlas became strong independent chemical companies. The court decision was a clear signal to DuPont that the explosives business could no longer be its main source of growth, and thus, the government played a major role in DuPont's move away from explosives and into a broader range of chemical products. During World War I, the government asked DuPont to make explosives again. In Deepwater, New Jersey, DuPont made its Carney's Point plant, which was built in 1892 and much bigger. It was now almost 70 times bigger than before the war. DuPont also built five other plants to help meet the need. The biggest plant was in Old Hickory, Tennessee. It made the raw materials for smokeless powder, including sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and gun cotton, which is a type of nitrate. Long after the war, in 1934, people accused DuPont of making too much money from the war. DuPont denied these charges when they and other weapons companies testified before the Senate Munitions Investigations Committee. After the war, DuPont became a research company that started new businesses. This was a continuation of a plan to modernize the company that began in 1902 when cousins Pierre, T. Coleman, and Alfred I. DuPont bought the company. With the help of company executive Arthur Moxham, the new owners looked for new ways to sell their products, new places to get raw materials, and new areas to expand into besides explosives. By the end of World War I, it was more profitable to sell artificial fibers in peacetime than to sell explosives. Moxham told his workers to think of DuPont as a chemical company. DuPont still made explosives, but it closed the Hagley Yard in 1921. By 1930, DuPont made things like seat fabric, gasoline additives, plastic, duco lacquers, rayon, cellophane, and more plastic. For World War II, DuPont designed, 
built and ran a plutonium plant for the Manhattan Project, which made the first atomic bomb. But by 1975, DuPont stopped making gunpowder. In the early 21st century, DuPont made things like communication tools, high-performance materials, coatings and color technologies, safety and protection gear, as well as farming and food products. DuPont grew as a research and manufacturing company in Delaware with more than 60,000 employees worldwide. But its original gunpowder mill on the Brandywine River became the Hagley Museum, where people can learn about the history of industry. Pierre Samuel Dupont de Moors died at a Lutheran mill on August 7, 1817, after helping fight a fire in the factory. He was the first Dupont to die as a result of a powder yard accident. Founder E.I. Dupont died in Philadelphia on October 31, 1834. And that's all we have on today's video. Do let us know what you think about the Dupont family and their rise to fame and affluence in the comments section down below. Also, don't forget to like the video as well as subscribe to Old Money Chronicles for more amazing content going forward. Thank you so much for watching this video till the end and I'll see you again in the next one. Bye now!